Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Social Development. Before we begin, I would like to welcome the new Minister to his first question time and wish him well. Questions number 5 and 12 have been withdrawn. We will start, of course, with listed questions, and I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Mr McMullen. Mr. question one. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, for your kind words. And uh, I certainly look forward to the challenge that has been presented in rising to fulfil my roles and responsibilities as Minister for Social Development. I understand that a meeting yesterday with the PSNI gave the Council an extension until the 31st of December to firm up proposals for purchasing the land. Both Newton Abbey Borough Council and the Housing Executive have expressed an interest. The Housing Executive expressed its interest on behalf of the Housing Associations. Housing Associations would then, in due course, have been responsible for buying the site and providing the housing. The Housing Executive itself would not have acquired the land. The Council's interest involves a concept plan for the wider area, including the PSNI site. And the plan will focus on attracting private sector investment, including commercial, leisure and recreation activity. Within this context, the Housing Executive made a decision to suspend its interest until this concept planning process was complete. The Housing Executive is still supportive of housing on the site and awaits the outcome of the PSNI decision-making process. For supplementary. And can, before I ask for supplementary, if I can, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I congratulate Mr. Story on his elevation? Can I, can I ask the Minister, could he, could he outline um, other sites uh, in the Glengormley area that his department is examining to meet the need for social housing in North Belfast? Well, I thank the member for his words of, of uh, congratulations. And uh, he has made specific reference to how many uh, other sites there are in uh, the area. And I think that there has been uh, a number of different projects that have been placed. I don't have all the detail in relation to the individual sites, but what I will do is I will write to the member and give him the details of all those. Oh, Mr. Nelson Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I also congratulate uh, the Minister on his, his appointment. Um, is the Minister um, aware of the significant housing need in the Glen Gormley area of North Belfast, especially in unionist estates such as Queen's Park? Uh, is he also aware of the failure of the housing executive over many years to meet that need in those communities uh, with no family homes in almost 40 years? And will he undertake to engage with the housing executive and with local representatives to see how the housing executive can provide new housing in appropriate locations for those communities? Yes, uh, the answer to those questions are yes, and I will endeavour to uh, do that. I think it is uh, very unacceptable and regrettable that there has been no family housing built in the last 15 years. In fact, the last social housing of any type was built in 1999, and that was a supported housing scheme for clients suffering from Milton Lillis. So I think there is a need for us to seriously look at this issue, and I undertake to have this matter addressed. Call Mr. Michael McJumpsey for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I too uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Story on his uh, promotion? I have no doubt his elevation will come as a great relief to the Minister of Education. Uh, can I ask question number two? Thank the member for his uh, kind words. I pass no comment in reference to uh, what the feelings of the Education Minister has been in relation to that issue. The Housing Executive has now advised me that the final land transaction for Hope Street was completed on the 12th of September uh, 2014 and confirms that the majority of the site is now in the Housing Executive's ownership, with Road Service and the Lincoln Group each retaining a small portion. The land in the Housing Executive ownership is currently vacant, and they are in the process of arranging a meeting with the Planning Service to discuss future usage of the site, both in the interim and in the long term. They are considering progressing an outline planning application on this particular site, 
And as someone who knows the area, and certainly uh, anyone who passes through that particular area, there is an, an issue of urgency in relation to addressing the particular needs. I find it somewhat uh, ironic that we are talking about Hope Street, and in that location there is very little hope has been given over the last number of years, and I trust that we can move in a way which is positive in regards to this particular location. Mr. Majimsi for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank uh, the Minister for that action, or, or for that answer, uh, and uh, uh, what is effective, I read, is a, as a call to action as far as this uh, vacant site is concerned. It is, as you are aware, not the only vacant derelict site in the Sandy Row area. And what we're getting now is a proliferation of applications for housing, but not social housing. It's for student accommodation. And this goes very much against the grain as far as the community is concerned. Well, I, uh, I would ask the, the minister uh, to uh, uh, meet with local representatives to discuss a way forward, because he's aware that this is a well-known arterial uh, street close to the city centre. and is, is very, very long. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Meet with local representatives to discuss the issues uh, 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 and drive some development forward that is acceptable to the local community. Yes, there's a short answer to that. Yes. Uh, however, I would I would go on to say that if if you look at the history of this particular site, we're going back as far as 1998, when the housing executive entered into an agreement with Lord Rana's company, Lincoln uh, Centre Belfast Limited. And there has been a lot of issues, a lot of discussion, ultimately leading to a court case in relation to this. So I would be quite happy to meet with the local representatives from the area and discuss this particular issue, but also look at the wider issue of the needs in that community. So as I said in my previous answer, we do give that community hope. And Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the Minister has pointed there, just uh, on the back of what Mr. McJimsey has been saying, this was a, uh, once described as the Golden Mile in Belfast, and you probably all recognise now that it's significantly tarnished. What you've reflected on, Minister, is the uh, demand, if you like. But can you point to a resource that will answer that demand at some point? Well, I think the Member is well aware of the current financial situation that we are in. And since I've come to the department, it's abundantly clear that not only is, uh, other, are other departments under huge financial strain, but particularly the Department of Social Development. The one thing that I have been uh, overwhelmed by since being appointed the minister is how this department impinges so much on all our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, both in relation to housing, uh, welfare, and the whole issue of regeneration. If we want to give a sense of hope to our communities, I believe that my department has a huge responsibility to ensure that we do give that hope, we do give that leadership. But we have to face up to some realities. It is unfortunately against the backdrop of a very, very difficult financial uh, situation. But I am certainly now looking at the budgets in terms of where allocations have been made in the past and where those allocations will lead us in the future. And Following on from my agreement to meet with local representatives for the area, I believe we can, as we have done in other places, give a sense of hope to those communities that the dereliction that currently prevails in those areas is not what they should live to expect and live amongst. Well, Mr. Mike Nesbitt for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question three. I think we can say that good progress is being made. Uh, not only are we, the waiting list figures coming down, but the numbers of new homes being built are significantly up. And for the first time in over a decade, uh, planned output is in line with the housing executive's assessment of what is actually needed. That need has been uh, determined at a requirement of 2,000 homes uh, in each of the next three years. And what is uh, pr uh, proposed in relation to that particular uh, programme? Where the waiting list is concerned, we have seen a drop of over 2,000 from last year. And at March 2013, there were over 41,000 applicants on the waiting list. Latest figures at June 2014 show just over 39,000 
and during the same period the numbers in housing stress have dropped by almost a thousand. At the same time we are also building increasing numbers of new homes. The programme for government target is to build 8,000 new social and affordable homes by 2015. Delivery has been running substantially ahead of the target for the past three years, which has no doubt had a positive impact on those waiting lists. Compared to the 8,000 target, I expect the final out outturn to be around 9,500. It is also worthwhile to note, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in social housing terms in Northern Ireland, we are outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. In England last year, one new social house was provided for every 60 applicants on the waiting list. In Scotland, the figure was one uh, for every 49. In Wales, the figure was one for every 44. But in Northern Ireland, the figure was one for every 30. So that, in relative terms, Northern Ireland is performing at twice the level of England. Paul, Mr. Stuart Dixon. Uh, uh, <laughs> Wouldn't need to do that. Much, uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer and wish him a successful tenure uh, in his uh, department. He will be aware that uh, previous net stock models indicated 1,900 uh, a year was the target for builds, plus 600 to make up for shortfalls. That, I see, uh, has changed. Can the Minister tell me why it has changed? And uh, does he accept what his predecessor always sought to deny, uh, that the programme for government targets are actually not sufficient? Well, I think if you look at the programme for government uh, targets for 11-15, we're committed to delivering 8,000 new social and affordable home starts. Uh, this was broken down by uh, some 6,000 new social starts and 2,000 new affordable starts. So I think that uh, in terms of what we have done to date is progress. Now, I will not be complacent in believing that in terms of all that we have said we will do, uh, that there is more that needs to be done. And I think that figures are always something that you have to ensure are accurate. Figures are something you always have to ensure are relevant to what is being uh, done on the ground. But when I looked at the figures in terms of the issue of social housing and affordable housing, because they are two very key component parts of the delivery of our housing programme, then I do believe that we need to focus in around what the commitment was, how we can continue to build on that commitment, and that's what I am determined to do as the new Minister for Social Development. Well, Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, welcome to and congratulations to the Minister on his appointment. Minister, what hope can we have that in the delivery of new social housing uh, programmes that you will put front and centre uh, sharing and integration as a policy and delivery model for new social housing uh, in Northern Ireland? Well, I think you always have to remember that uh, the issue of housing is driven by demand. It's also driven by the desire of the, the people who want to be part of that housing provision. And housing uh, need, as defined in the current uh, process, uh, gives us a number of elements to that provision. And I think that what I want to see, and uh, I've already had some look at the uh, provision that we do have across Northern Ireland of uh, social housing, and I've, I'm well aware of the two projects that were transferred uh, into the new regime, uh, one in Londonderry and also one in Bloomfield. And what I have asked my officials to do in relation to that is, I want to see how, how successful have they been, uh, how, what, how, what has been the problems that they have encountered, and what needs to be done to change the model, so that, if it needs change, so that we do actually encourage people to live in a way that reflects our society, reflects our community, and gives them, first and foremost, good, affordable and standard of housing, which I believe they all deserve. Well, Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, of course, join in congratulating my uh, honourable friend on his elevation. Uh, both he and his immediate predecessor have uh, indicated the scale of affordable and social housing that has been provided in recent years. Has he got any figures that he could supply for the immediate preceding period of the four or five years beyond that? Uh, and if not, perhaps he could write to me. I well, thank uh, my colleague, and I know that uh, he, in his previous ministerial roles, knows just uh, the challenge that is uh, before us as we have come to take up this particular post. 
The programme for government commitment to deliver 8,000 new social and affordable homes uh, was set out by 2015. In the past three years, 6,911 new social and affordable housing uh, has already been delivered. A further 2,500 are due this year, and that will give a total of over 9,400 new social and affordable homes against the original target of 8,000. In 11-12, the target was to deliver 1,900 new homes, 1,400 social and 500 affordable, and a total of 2,053 was delivered, the breakdown between social and affordable being 1,400 social and 643 affordable. Uh, in 12-13, the target was to deliver 1,825, 1,325 social and 500 affordable, a total of 2,336 were delivered. And so I could go on giving you all the figures in relation to 13-14. And I think that that gives us the overall view that uh, the progress that has been made, and I'm certainly happy to make all those figures available uh, to the member in writing. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey. Good Deputy Speaker. Could I, like other members, wish the Minister all the best in his new appointment. May he bring to it the same passion and commitment that he's brought to education. Could I follow through in terms of the question? Could the Minister look urgently at the demand for bungalow accommodation and new build programmes? It is an issue that I, I brought to the floor to the previous Minister because, in fact, there's many disabled families, older people in our communities, who are deprived of allowing them to get a bungalow because the housing associations just will not build them for financial reasons. I uh, thank the member for his comments. and I have to say on a personal level I will miss uh, the uh, interacts in relation to education. and uh, I trust that, uh, that those that we work with in education, uh, as I know they have in comments that they have made recently, appreciate the efforts that we made. And I trust that I will bring to this department uh, a sense of enthusiasm as I endeavour to do in education. And members, I come here with no uh, elevated opinion of my ability. I come here as someone who is very proud of my working class background. I was born, as most members know, in the village of Armoy. I am extremely uh, proud of that fact. And I won't forget, uh, and the grace of God will ena enable me not to forget uh, who I am. And I realise the real issues that are out there for our community. And the member has made a specific reference to the issue of the provision of uh, particular types of dwellings for people who have disability and others. And I know as a constituent MLA the challenge that uh, that is. And I give the member an assurance that that is an issue I will look at. And I am quite happy to respond to the minister, uh, to the member, whenever I get uh, an update on that particular issue, because I do think that he raises a very valid point in this House, and it is something that I will have a concern about. And indeed, I have already had some discussions with uh, some of the providers. I plan to meet uh, those who provide the uh, social housing, the housing executive. There are huge issues. There are big challenges in relation to the housing executive. And uh, I will be meeting the chair and the chief executive tomorrow, and we will be having uh, frank and open discussions, and it is my intention to very quickly get a handle on what is happening in relation to the housing executive, what is being delivered in terms of social and affordable housing. And I think, for my part, that is something that I trust I will bring the passion and commitment, as I, I trust I did, in relation to education. Call Ms. Claire Sugden for a question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and many congratulations to the Minister in his new role. I just hope he'll be mindful of his neighbouring constituency, East London Derry, when making decisions in his new office. Uh, question number four. Thank you. I thank the member for her kind words, and I can assure you that uh, her other colleagues in that constituency uh, remind me constantly uh, of what uh, is across the ban in East London Derry. Whilst Preparation for community planning is a matter for the Department of the Environment and Councils. I can confirm that my department, in the run-up to the transfer of agreed urban and regeneration and community development powers under the form of the local government on 1 April 2015, has and continues to work closely with organisations that it supports through, for example, neighbourhood renewal, areas at risk and the Community Investment Fund. This ongoing support has proved vital to managing this period of change 
and has ranged from advising organisations of what the transfer of powers means to them, to meeting with neighbourhood uh, partnerships and with local uh, representatives in the area. Uh, thank you for your uh, response. Um, will the Minister acknowledge the growing uncertainty amongst community involvement groups in relation to um, the transfer community planning with less than six months to go? Yes, I do. And, and, uh, I can assure the member that this is an issue which uh, is reference made to it in, in other questions before the House today. Uh, the issue of the Regeneration and Housing Bill is a matter of grave concern. And uh, I'm not coming to this House to give anyone any misleading information when I say that a decision will have to be made very soon. And I've made it very clear that a decision will be made. And uh, those that have in the past to date blocked the uh, progress of the Regeneration and Housing Bill and the issues which are associated in regards to how those powers will be transferred to councils need to give reasons as to why that is the case. Because to date, and uh, I am uh, very clear on this, to date I haven't seen any information which is any way substantive, which gives any uh, degree of understanding as to why concerns have been raised. And so I have uh, met with some of those who have raised concerns. I have raised this at the executive uh, last Thursday as an issue, and I can assure you that it is a matter of importance for me because my department is contributing to the transfer in relation to this issue, somewhere in the region of 60 or 65 million pounds, it has the largest proportion of the overall budget which would transfer to local councils. And I'm well aware also of the concern in the new councils as to the uh, key component part that this would play in how they would be able to roll out over the lifetime of the new councils projects which for them are vitally important to rejuvenate and to bring new life into their council areas. Well, Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Deputy Chair, could I congratulate the Minister on his elevation and also congratulate Mr. McCausland, the outgoing Minister, on, the, on a job well done? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, could I ask the Minister, when the Minister gets an update on the regeneration uh, housing bill, will he make sure that it comes here to this House? Yes, uh, and I thank my colleague for his words, and I also uh, do concur and apologise for not doing that at the start. Pay tribute to my predecessor, Mr Nelson McCausland, uh, someone whom, with whom I worked closely down through the years, not only in this House but in, in other organisations. And uh, I know that uh, he has uh, endeavoured in his role to ensure that the department uh, was focused around many of the issues which we have already discussed here this morning. Uh, in many respects uh, to the member, some of the issues which I raised in response to the previous question have been, been raised. Uh, and I have uh, seen when I read through the paperwork in relation to this that there had been attempts to table this particular piece of legislation uh, at the executive on a number of occasions. And uh, to date, we still haven't had any progress as to how that matter can be resolved. But I had a meeting uh, with the chair of the uh, committee, the DSD committee. <coughs> I plan to meet the chair again in relation to this issue, as I will uh, the members of the committee, uh, because I believe there is a serious issue, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, around giving confidence to the people of Northern Ireland. The confidence of the people of Northern Ireland at this minute in time in this institution I think is pretty low. And people uh, have a view that uh, really there is little need for this place to be in existence. However, let us be under no illusion that if we do not have the transfer of the powers that currently are outlined in relation to the Regeneration and Housing Bill, then I believe that local councils will also then be saying that there is no need for this place to be in existence. And so it is a serious situation and I look forward to meaningful engagement and discussions over the next few days because I think that's the time frame.
that we're dealing with here in regards to making decisions as to how this issue will be progressed. Mr. Colum Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I add my words of congratulations uh, to the Minister. I uh, look forward to, uh, I'm sure, will be fairly a robust debate in the, the time ahead. Uh, can I ask him, with regard to the powers being transferred, um, if and when th they are transferred, can he guarantee that each and every area uh, will not lose budget when it comes to community development and uh, regeneration functions? Well, I, I thank the member uh, for his comments, and, and yes, I will uh, endeavour to not disappoint him whenever there are issues of being robust in terms of uh, discussions around this issue. At the minute, the budget as it currently stands uh, is always subject to what the final arrangements and agreement will be. But I have to say that I am concerned that the envelope which was originally envisaged, and I think the package was somewhere in the region of, of 90 million, uh, and as I said, the largest percentage of that, the largest part of that, was uh, 65 million coming out from the DSD budget to carry out those functions, will have to be reconsidered in the, in the event of whatever the decision is. Because uh, along with my other colleagues uh, who have been uh, appointed as new ministers, my colleague Mr Wales, the one thing that has been for me a very stark reality and wake up call is the serious situation that we are in in terms of the budget. Let's not get uh, tied up about the issue of welfare reform. That is another issue. But the issue of budget, the 4% or is it 6% or is it 8% or or is it 8 percent or as it may be in terms of the future higher than that, just to ensure that we as an executive and as an administration live within our means. That is a very serious situation. And, and I can't under line enough how serious that situation is. I was taken aback somewhat when I had meetings with my officials about the, the size of my department in terms of the number of people that we employ. Somewhere in the region of over 7,000 people in the Department of Social Development with over 70 locations in Northern Ireland and then 3,000 uh, personnel in the housing executive. I have to say I have a statutory responsibility to protect uh, Social Security. I will give that a priority, as, as my statutory responsibility is, but I can assure the member that the issue of finance is on the top of the agenda in my department. I call Mr Steve Mutter for question. Question number six, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the following schemes are included in the Housing Executive's uh, planned maintenance programme for Upper Ban in 2014-15. The external sick legal maintenance for 204 dwellings, double glazing installation for 398 dwellings, kitchen replacements for 289 dwellings, heating installations for 341 dwellings, and the projected budget spend for 2014-15 is £3.7 million. Mr. Mutri for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. And like others, I would concur with the remarks made in relation to him and indeed his predecessor. Uh, can I ask the Minister then, is he confident that these very worthwhile schemes can be delivered on time given the current financial circumstances? Well, I think that there always is a concern that you, you have around how any proposal, when it is brought to the uh, brought to fruition, uh, how it can be completed, given the context of the current financial situation. But if you, if you look, and I think members, we all do well to uh, look at all our constituencies, constituencies to see how these particular projects and programmes have been of a benefit to the people uh, in your own constituency and in all our constituencies, where if you look at the number of dwellings that have uh, been greatly enhanced and the quality of life, whether it be as a result of the external cyclical maintenance, the double glazing installation, the kitchen replacements, the replacement of fire doors to flats with communal access, heating installations in your own constituency of Upper Ban in 1314, uh, uh, 464 dwellings 
actually benefit as a result of those heating installations. I think that that is something that we ought to be uh, pleased has been achieved. Uh, and I, as I said to the previous question, uh, the issue of budget is something which is, for me, at the top of the agenda because I want to protect these services and deliver in a meaningful way to the people of Northern Ireland. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions. Can I tell you that question nine has been withdrawn? And I call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Mrs. Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I also join the course and welcome the new minister and his very challenging role in social development? Can the minister provide uh, an update on the external cyclical maintenance scheme by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive within Ballyclare? Uh, I thank the member for her uh, insight uh, how challenging uh, this role is going to be. And I can assure you, over the last uh, week since being uh, put into the position, I just know how challenging that is. The Housing Executive has advised me that the external cyclical maintenance scheme for Ballyclare has recently been commissioned and that the start date is currently the 30th of March 2015. There are 103 dwellings included in the scheme, which is at a briefing stage uh, at uh, the moment, and none of the properties are on the stock transfer list. Mrs. Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer and ask when the last ECM scheme was carried out in Ballyclare? Well, uh, I thank the, the, the member for that supplementary, and I think, as I said in relation to uh, the issue in regards to uh, Glengormley. Here we have another serious issue because the last external cyclical maintenance scheme that was carried out in Ballyclare was between 2003 and 2006. And I have to say, I don't believe that that in any way is acceptable in terms of how uh, this uh, process is carried out. On a general note with regard to the ECM schemes, uh, the work content and the unit costs for those schemes has changed a number of times in recent years in response to rising costs and competing demand of other work streams in the investment programme. Consequently, the external cyclical maintenance programme will be revised and reviewed as part of the Housing Executive's new strategic approach. And I intend to raise this issue with the Housing Executive. Uh, when I meet uh, tomorrow uh, for my first time with the Chair and the Chief Executive. And as I said to other members in the House earlier, uh, there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done uh, between my department and the Housing Executive. And I think the Housing Executive uh, does much good work. Indeed, uh, before coming to the House today, I was in East Belfast uh, to see just how uh, the particular scheme uh, in, uh, in the Diamond project, how that scheme is actually delivering through the housing executive benefit to the people who live in that area. So it can be done, but when you look at uh, figures that say in terms of this particular scheme, the last time uh, the schemes were carried out was 2003 and 2006, it raises serious questions about uh, the way in which this scheme has been operated. Well, Mr Ian McRae for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I too would like to join the, the chorus of um, members who are, have welcomed the Minister to his post and wish him well. Uh, can the Minister provide an update on the Macrofelt Town Centre Master Plan? Uh, I think it's also maybe good to maybe note in the House that uh, I have no hand in who asked these questions. Because when you look at uh, the topicals, you might think that I was involved in some sinister plot or plan, Mr. Deputy Speaker. However, as a good Calvinist, as a good Calvinist, I have to say I believe in providence, and so uh, I was delighted when I saw. The, I, I was delighted when I saw that uh, the first number of questions were from my colleagues. Getting back to the issue at hand. Uh, the member has rightly asked in relation to the uh, Macrofelt master plan. And in terms of master plans, I have to say I've been impressed by the variety and the number of them. Uh, and uh, 
I am very keen to get up to speed with all that they uh, intend to deliver for the communities. But in terms of Mark Felt, it was launched in July 2011, and the document sets out a vision for the future development of the town centre, and the plan sets out 32 actions, the priority and the potential delivery uh, with partners for each of those actions. DSD is represented on the Town Centre Forum, which comprises of town councillors, Chamber of Commerce, representatives and council officials who oversee the implementation of the actions contained within the Master Plan. And to date, my department has also progressed and completed a number of other activities set out in the Master Plan, such as under the growing and supporting and retail commercial sector frame. My department supported the branding and marketing strategy, Wi-Fi and the smartphone app and also under the Improving Townscape Quality Shop Front Improvements theme, my department fu uh, funded a revitalisation scheme for Queen Street. Well, Mr McRae for supplementary. Yeah. I thank the Minister for that um, update. In respect of the um, Macrofelt um, Master Plan, what assurance can the Minister give that the master plan will actually be taken forward um, post the reform of um, local government. And the member raises for me an important issue because we've had, had just some discussion around the transfer of powers. But I want to be absolutely sure that in terms of the transfer of those powers, that the, the objective of the master plans is carried out as was originally envisaged. Now, obviously, uh, we don't want to have a command and control uh, situation whereby uh, Big Brother, in a sense, the department, my department is overseeing this, because under the reform of local government, the responsibility for the delivery of the master plan initiatives will rest with the new Mid Ulster Council. And Council was fully involved in the preparation of the master plan and the current site on the town centre uh, forum. So my officials are working closely with Council to ensure that there is a smooth transfer and that in terms of the functions and all the related activities that they are carried out in a way which ensures we have progress and continuity. My department has committed funding of £90,000 to progress the scheme uh, to detailed design of readiness for construction and this work is due to be completed in March. Uh, 2015, and that's in particular reference to the, master, the Macrofelt Public Realm Scheme, which was identified as a key regeneration initiative in the Master Plan. Call Miss Anna Lowe for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would like, uh, like others to congratulate the Minister on his new appointment and welcome him to his first question time. Um, one of the biggest challenges for the minister is probably restoring credibility of his office. And I, you know, after, after several very turbulent uh, few years, can I ask the minister to commit himself to the House that he will get his department to fully cooperate with the current Red Sky investigation so that the public will be assured that the department has nothing to hide. I thank the, the member for her question. And let me say to the member, I come to this House, as I said earlier, I don't come with any uh, overinflated views of my ability. But what I do come with is a determination to ensure that I carry out my responsibilities to the best of my ability. And I have made that very clear to my officials and to those for whom I am responsible. Yes, the reality of being appointed to the position of a minister in this executive is the buck stops here. And so I have a responsibility and I will bring to my job the skills which I trust I endeavoured to bring to education. Others will judge as to whether or not those skills were relevant, useful or needful. But I have to say that I am quite open for the scrutiny, I am quite open for the discussions, I am quite open for the debates, and yes, when it is necessary, I will be quite open for the criticism. And as far as I am concerned, those for me will be guiding principles. I do not claim infallibility. 
I don't claim to be perfect. I have weaknesses like everyone else, but I can assure the member and I can assure this House that I will do this job to the best of my ability. Because, and let me say this, if the one thing has impressed, or maybe impressed the wrong word, has challenged me, is the need in many homes in Northern Ireland. Needs which I believe my department can meet, whether it, be, whether it is in regards to housing, whether it is in regards to regeneration, whether it is in regards to the issue of benefit, because I think those are the things that matter to people. Those are the things that we will endeavour to try and address. Call Ms. Lowe for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I certainly sincerely thank the Minister for his very comprehensive commitment to this House uh, to do his best. Unfortunately, the credibility of the Department was damaged by more than simply the Red Sky issue. Allegations of political interference in housing allocation in North Belfast have held up much needed housing schemes. Will you restore credibility to the Department by stepping back and taking independent advice so the issue can be addressed transparently? I am disappointed <clears throat> that the member feels that it is necessary to make such an allegation, because the figures do not prove that that is the case. And maybe, maybe the member that she is sitting beside would be prepared more to ask the question rather than you, because obviously it seems as though the member who is giving you the information has more an interest in this issue, given his involvement in the committee. So I have to say, you know, we, we had some allegations uh, in the, the press uh, just a few days ago in regards to some plan that my department had about trying to do something subversive uh, in regards to the Bally Sillon Master Plan. Nothing could be further from the truth. And, you know, there can be no changes, for example, in regards to the issue of, of schools in the area. It was made quite clear in the, the statement that was made, which included a comment from the Department of Education, that they can't, I can do nothing without there being a development proposal being brought to the table. There is process. And unfortunately, process can be very slow and pro process can be very uh, difficult and challenging. But I can give the uh, member this assurance. I will pay due regard and will pay close diligence to process. And I trust that no one in this House from any political party believes that somehow they have someone in place who they think they can manipulate, they can corral, they can change, because there is an issue of ensuring that my department continues to deliver in a, a, a way which reflects the needs of my community, the community that we serve, the people of Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Edwin Putz for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and congratulations to the Minister on, on his appointment. Uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, there are communities out there in disadvantaged areas which are, fall outside of the neighbourhood renewal areas and lots of the other um, catch-alls. There are many communities <coughs> which need support and, and need work, and there is much good work happening in those communities. What is the Department doing to assist those communities? And, and I think the, the uh, member raises a, a very important role, and can I just on a personal level uh, thank him for the yeah, contribution yeah. that he made? Uh, and I trust that I, when he was Minister for Health, and I trust that I can bring the same determined focus to my department as he did when he was uh, Minister for Health. The department recognises that uh, tackling the spiral, uh, the spatial deprivation through the neighbourhood renewal can leave out smaller areas, and there can be places where there are difficulties and there are challenges. So, as a result, areas at risk. A uh, programme to provide support to communities outside the noble 10 per cent most disadvantaged communities, but which have been identified at risk of decline. A uh, small pockets of deprivation programme created to complement the implementation of the neighbourhood renewal strategy and target areas of population are under 1,000. Uh, these area-based interventions were designed to target substantive concentrations 
of deprivation. And in addition, my department provides a wide range of support to individual families, households and communities through the provision of decent and affordable housing, actions to address fuel poverty, child maintenance arrangements, comprehensive social security provisions and the supporting the voluntary and community sector. I'm afraid time is up. There is some time for a supplementary.